Hello. This is our fourth installment of the evangelization training, and I'm so grateful that if anyone would tune in and uh, listen and be equipped in a better position to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, I'm very sorry about the slow transmission. My computer is about uh, as young as my youngest grandchild, so it's a few years old. And I'll try to go a little bit slow so I don't go faster than the sound can record. The fear of witnessing sometimes is a fear of rejection, a fear of being ostracized. There is a fear also that of being humiliated in front of others or that person will distance themselves from you forever and they will never again actually try to approach you again and it's a it's a very difficult thing at times you're going to be fearing man more than God instead think of it this way fear their separation from God for eternity we should fear God more than we fear man because someday in eternity it's going to be too late for us and we're going to probably look back at things, at the opportunities that we had that were lost because we feared rejection. Instead, fear their eternal destination. Fear what stands before them in the eternity and the dark abyss. And eventually, at Revelation 20 says, the great white throne judgment, they'll be cast into a lake of fire. If you think about that in that long-term sense, it'll make you think of it love for that person that you would not even want to see your worst enemy hopefully you don't have enemies but someone that most despises you because you're a Christian be separated forever with no second chance at all if you've ever seen maybe I mentioned this before the, the movie The Abyss uh, and also even more so let me actually say The Perfect Storm is a better example in The Perfect Storm it shows the uh, hurricane the ship is going down and the captain and Bobby uh, they says well the captain said let's get out of here well Bobby goes ahead and comes to the surface the captain ends up looking upward to Bobby as he goes to the surface and he goes back into the ship and goes down into eternity into a dark deep abyss and you can tell from the movie that he's not a believer he's not a Christian and there's no indication that Bobby either is a Christian Christianity is not even mentioned in the book and also in the movie so think of that the perfect storm at the ending of that movie it shows the captain going down into the dark abyss darkness utter darkness forever no chance for reconciliation cut off from God for all eternity you have to think in those terms to give you encouragement the confidence to witness because you're doing this out of love greater love has no man or woman than to give his life for another and in this sense you're going to give your humiliation you're going to give up your uh, sense of dignity and respect perhaps but that's okay you're thinking about that person in the long term future you can't think it in the short term the captain goes down into the dark abyss Bobby goes upward and as he's floating there he's thinking of his his girlfriend his fiance and he's saying that love love lasts forever and it does we want to show them the love of God and not fear what they're going to say to us or reject us they're rejecting Jesus Christ they're not rejecting us they're rejecting the message another example of that would be that uh, for example Kublai Khan and Muhammad and Gandhi uh, they drop the ball on those men where they had the chance to witness to those men and they could have made a huge difference in their world and uh, they chose not to do that so but I also don't want to forget about sharing the gospel with children and you have children in your family perhaps uh, brothers sisters nephews nieces your own children grandchildren I'd highly recommend a book that as a Sunday school teacher for a lot of years many years uh, I taught third and fourth grade combined for a Southern Baptist Church John MacArthur is an excellent theologian teacher pastor and he has a book called A Faith to Grow On. A Faith to Grow On should be in every church's library. 
absolutely sterling way to present the gospel to young children. I already told you about the young boy that was in the kitchen that had the knife pointed at his chest. He was going to cut open his heart to let Jesus come into his heart. It was not presented in the way that he understood. Children are kind of concrete thinkers. They can't think in complex, abstract ways. They take things literally. There was a story of a young boy who his sister was very sick and she needed a blood transfusion and a little bit of blood and her blood matched perfectly that of her her uh, brother and her brother was the only one that was available at that time with this rare type of blood I can't remember what it was what type but the, they asked the boy the father asked the boy would you be willing to give up your blood the boy hesitated for a long time he kind of fudged and he thought about it after a while he goes yes daddy I'll do it so he went into the uh, and went into a room where they started drawing blood out of him and they were going to transfer it to a machine and then introduce it into his sister who needed it it was a matter of life or death for his sister I can't remember the circumstance or the time but it's a true story uh, a former pastor of mine told me this, just how children think. As the young boy watched his blood go up a tube and into a machine and going into his sister, the young boy said, Daddy, what's it feel like when you die? And of course the father didn't know. He says, no one really knows, but if you believe in Jesus Christ, and believe that he's real and that he died for you and me and trust in him then you will live for eternity he goes no I mean die from my blood going out he goes oh son you're not going to die we're just using some of your blood to help your sister the boy was apparently thinking he was going to die by giving his blood to his sister and even so willingly that young boy the son of that daddy was willing to give his life for his sister he thought his blood was all going to go into his sister therefore he would not live that is so touching that young boy was willing to give his life for his sister even though he was not going to die that's what he thought that's why he hesitated but he was still willing to do that that's what it means we're going to give up our reputation our dignity self-respect to try to witness to other people because they're going to die and that blood that's provided is from the Lamb of God and will keep them for eternity away from the wrath of God so John MacArthur's book it doesn't have that story in there but a faith to grow on is a wonderful book I would recommend it now children young or old really believe in, in a lot of times they do believe in Jesus they they think they're going to uh, go to heaven if they're believing in Jesus Christ a childlike faith sometimes is so precious adults are more cynical adults seem to be more skeptical uh, something that is freely offered uh, you know if you offered them someone well I'll get three easy payments for sixty nine ninety five they'd be more willing to take that but something that is free they deem that worthless and it doesn't have any real value to them in that respect because it is free but children childlike faith Jesus said suffer the little children to come to me for such is the kingdom of God that is because the faith of a child is so precious and trusting my son one time when I dropped him off at his grandma's just cried and cried thinking you know when children are young they think they're going to be separated forever from their parents I reassured him and told him I would return I you have to trust me I will come back and oh the joy when he saw me come back and he trusted me from the next time on that well, I meant what I said and I said what I meant and he fully relied on me I said this is more so with Jesus you can believe in Jesus because humans sometimes lie they'll tell stories they'll exaggerate they'll steal things but Jesus is completely 100 percent reliable Jesus will never leave you he will never 
ever lie. God cannot lie. God is holy. So that's what I told my children and uh, I'm also trying to tell my grandchildren. But I have never tried to pressure them into believing. It has to be something that the child comes to faith in. I might tell them that your mother and father, I am going to heaven because I believe in Jesus that he died and rose again and that he'll come for us someday that we can live with him for eternity because we do terrible things sometimes as people we make a lot of mistakes I told my son one time you know you make mistakes and I discipline you because I love you but nothing you can do will ever stop making me love you my love is permanent and forever God's love is even more perfect than that he loves you more than I can love you but I've never pressured him to get saved I never pressured him to get baptized uh, and I always allowed the Holy Spirit but I prayed for my children that the Holy Spirit would convict them when they come to the age of accountability that they would come to saving faith in Christ the age of accountability no one knows when that is some people it might even be in the 20s might even be in the teens only God alone knows when the age of accountability of each person comes my youngest daughter came to faith at seven and my son it took him into his 20s the fact is God has his timing just perfect for his call John 6 44 says that he does the calling Jesus does the saving the Holy Spirit does the convicting but I had to tell them the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ if they don't know about it they're never going to come to saving faith unless you tell the same thing is there as in the boy who thought he was going to die we have to die to ourselves allow yourself to be humbled before God so that Jesus is glorified by bringing many sons and daughters men and women to Christ for eternity now sometimes you'll hear people say well I am a Christian and I don't attend church I don't feel like I need to attend church and sometimes you'll see a carnal Christian they'll say oh, I'm a carnal Christian and there's times that I really worry for them because there's a scripture that it says one day they will say they will come to Jesus and say Lord Lord did we not do this and do you know do good works for you and feed the poor and Jesus would say depart from me you wicked ones who do works there he's saying that I never knew you you cannot establish your relationship with the vine Jesus says in John 15:5. In John 15 5 he says I am the vine and you are the branches the one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me you have to be able to be producing fruit if you cannot do that if you're detached from the vine several people I've spoke with are saying that they are Christians church never saved anyone no Jesus Christ does the saving the Holy Spirit brings conviction and the Father draws them but no there I can think of no Lone Ranger Christians in the church in the New Testament they're always in the body of Christ I have a large yard that's got several pecan trees on it some of these and a black oak and they're over a hundred years or so and they put out a lot of branches once these branches are broken off I rake them up and I put them into a big pile and branches that are not attached to the vine or the tree anymore are broken off and they are burned that's the analogy I think it is the big pile is destined for the burn pile Jesus warns in John 15 6 a serious warning to me John 15 6 it's right after I he said he is the vine if you do not remain in me you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned 
Now it's lost its source of nourishment and it's of its feeding. It's not attached to the vine. It's in a state of decay. It's subject to disease and termites and such. If you do not attach to the vine, you're not going to produce fruit. I heard about a fellow that, uh, you've heard this story maybe, a fellow courted a girl by writing her a beautiful love letter every day for two years and he was not able to visit her. Apparently he lived some distance. For two years, every day, he wrote her a love letter. He thought, what a wonderful way to court her. You know what happened? She married the mail carrier. There's nothing like being there in the body of Christ. You cannot get it at home. One co-worker mentioned to me that he has two or three people that come over to his house. He doesn't need church. They study the Bible. I said, that's fine. You have a Bible study. You do not have a church. Others will say, well, where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is. That is taking text out of context and making it a pretext. What is happening is they're trying to take a text that Jesus said where he is present. That was addressing church discipline. I said you'll need to read the entire chapter and sometimes before that chapter to make sure that you're taking the whole thing in context because you cannot take scripture out of context and make it a doctrine. Sadly, only 17% of self-proclaimed Christians attend church. That's, only, that's less than 2 in 10, or less than 1 out of 5 professing Christians. I have a fear someday that one day they may hear the Lord Jesus Christ tell them, Depart. I never knew you. If you're not attached to the body of Christ, how can you know Now, I consider myself part of the body of Christ, too. I'm a pastor, and uh, I, I'm, I call myself, really, I would say, an under-shepherd. I'm thinking of the body of Christ as like the body. We are many members, but one body. Now, if you're not attached to the body, imagine this. I lost the tip of my finger one time in a sawmill when I was young. We put it in ice, took it to the hospital, and sewed it on. If that finger would have remained detached from the body, it would have died. Unless a member remains in the body, they are subject to decay, gangrene, and in some cases, we don't know the sovereignty of God. He may allow a person to be taken home early if he is a Christian. Uh, I don't think if they're really a Christian, they will not lose their salvation. But their rewards will be like wood, hay, and stubble. They will be burned up, but they themselves will be saved. So they're not going to have many rewards. Hebrews 10.25 clearly says, Hebrews 10.25, Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some. So apparently the writer of Hebrews, some say it's Paul, I don't know, it's others, Luke, uh, my seminary professors say there's really no conclusive proof of who wrote Hebrews. Ultimately, God has written all scripture as it's all God-breathed. The point is, the Bible or God says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves. Apparently, there was happening in Paul's day and in the, in the Apostles' day at that time. It is the church of Jesus Christ. It is not the church in your home. And it is not bodyless. He equips some to be teachers, uh, evangelists. Uh, some have the gift of mercy. Some, you know, have the uh, different gifts of the fruit. You cannot have those gifts if you're only attending at home. You're only watching church services at home. You cannot exercise loving one another. Jesus, or the, the New Testament actually says, love one another so many times that how can you do that if you're at home and not fellowshipping within the body of Christ? 
by the way, we go out Saturdays and canvas the neighborhood and share the gospel. No one who doesn't attend church goes out to share the gospel. No one who stays at home serves in a children's ministry. No one who stays at home teaches a Sunday school lesson. A stay-at-home Christian does not grow in the grace and knowledge because you grow as members and you get equipped from church leadership. You cannot do that at home. They produce no fruit. They lose opportunities to serve one another in the church. No branches, again, live apart from the vine. Christians, yeah, they probably can still be saved and not attend church since salvation is not at work oriented, but we're not saved by works, but we're saved for works. And how can we do good works for the body of Christ if we're not in the body of Christ? A lot of different pathways, yes. There's one narrow path, and that is Jesus Christ. No one comes to the Jesus Christ except through six John 6:44 says, no person comes to God except through Jesus Christ alone. Jesus Christ dwells where those worshipers are at. He may dwell with you in the Holy Spirit in your home, but you're going to lose a great opportunity. Ephesians 4.16 makes no sense if you're a Lone Ranger Christian at home. Ephesians 4.16 says, from him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Ephesians 4.16 clearly shows this can't happen. One person by themselves cannot be attached to anything. They can't. There's no ligaments attached. There's no building itself up. Each part does its work. You're only one part. It's impossible. Ephesians 4.11, Christ gave himself, as I said, the, for apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, to equip the people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Not for the member would be built up, but the body. The body constitutes many members, many parts. You know, Jesus is the shepherd. And in the old days, shepherds were the door. They were the gatekeeper. And they guarded the door, and the shepherds would sleep at the gate at night. Let me say, sheep are not very smart. Well, sheep left to themselves are very vulnerable to the wolves. A sheep, for example, that lands on its back, it has no capability to right itself, and it will lay on its back and starve to death. Sheep also don't know any better, and they don't know that the shepherd will move them to areas where there's fresh grass. Otherwise, sheep will just stay there and eat the roots and start chomping on dirt. Sheep have to be led to green pastures. Psalm 23 is a good description of sheep. They're not very smart. They'll actually run off a cliff. They won't even go near water if it's running because they have fear. Psalm 23 says that he leads me to still waters. He guides me. He leads me through the shadow of death. If a lone sheep left to itself is in a perilous state, he is the shepherd and he risked his life. In fact, he gave his life for his sheep. Sheep wanders off. Jesus said he left the 99 to seek the one that was lost. No good shepherd would ever allow his sheep to wander around with no protection, no shepherd, and let them go out there by themselves. We are his flock. Nor should any sheep decide that they can make it by themselves outside of the good shepherd's fold. Sheep are the most helpless, defenseless of all animals. They can't run fast, they can't defend themselves, and they're startled so easily that they could sometimes die on the spot. Sheep are not very smart. We're all like sheep have gone astray. We need a shepherd. The great shepherd is Jesus Christ. When a sheep, like I say, will they, they will starve to death, 
They are vulnerable to predators and wolves, mountain lions. Individual sheep are easy prey, but the shepherd protects them and sheep gathered in numbers are safer. So if you decide not to find a local church you might or attend one, you're going to lose your protection, I believe, of the great shepherd. The prayers of the saints, we pray for one another, you'll lose that protection as well. You'll fail to grow in grace and knowledge, and you'll be vulnerable to the enemy, Satan and his demons, spiritual attacks, plus God will correct you. He corrects every son and daughter that he loves. The idea that church is full of hypocrites, I've heard that before. Your church is full of hypocrites. Why should I attend there? Well, the body of Christ are composed of sinners. We're all sinners. We all struggle with sin. We are not perfect. We all make mistakes. It's full of hypocrites, yes. But there's always room for one more. Let me conclude with saying the best way to help a church that you think is not a good church is to join it and try to make it better. If it's, you're looking for a perfect church, then don't join it because then you've just ruined it. I hope you will look at those reasons for people that, that to be obedient to attend church and try to come up with reasons for them that they should attend church. If they say they are a professing Christian, then you can be ready and equipped. And the scriptures sometimes are, are full of uh, these. Ephesians 4 and then Hebrews 10 shows you that we need one another. We need to uphold one another in prayer. We need to grow in grace and knowledge and to serve one another and to serve our community in love and do ministry together. No Lone Ranger Christian in the church that I ever remember hearing about. The only one I can think of was the evangel well, the Philip the Evangelist caught up with the, the eunuch and he took the Ethiopian eunuch and he took the gospel back to Africa. And I believe that's how the church in Africa, in fact there's historical records indicating that this man, the eunuch, brought back the gospel as he was reading the book of Isaiah, he was finally saved and got baptized and he brought the gospel back to Africa. He did not stay a believer by himself. So you will not find any Lone Ranger Christians in the church. The next couple of uh, lessons were going to be done. Five and six will be it. I'll go over some things that are where people attack the idea of creation. Uh, is there evidence against evolution? What is historical evidence for Jesus Christ and, and his historicity? The fact that is a, he is a historical fact. The overwhelming evidence of his resurrection. The 500 plus witnesses and the experts that have tried to say that, that this evidence is so strong that it would hold up in a court of law about Jesus' resurrection. Also talk about archaeology, the historical records of that. We'll go into a little bit of scientific evidence for creation, philosophy, and logic. And I think you'll like the apologetics because it'll be prepared to give an answer for those, for the reason of the hope that is within you, to give a reason in a gentle, loving, a kind way. No one was ever argued into heaven. We won't have to. The facts are that evolution has remained in a theory for over 150 years and is still hypothetical and that scientific support is continuing to dwindle. In fact, I heard a stat the other day, 300 atheists are, there are 300 less atheists every day and 85,000 more Christians every day and that number is growing. You can be part of that solution and bring as many men and women, children, the kingdom of heaven as God may permit. Thank you and God bless you for your passion for evangelism and may God richly bless you. See you at lesson five and six.